Okay, good morning. Um, and welcome to my talk today. Um, yeah, good morning or good afternoon, good evening. I don't really know from where exactly or which time zone you are dialing in right now. I am recording the talk at least at 11 o'clock in the morning. So I think that's about the same time as it's going to be done in, um, in, the, in the conference. Um, if you have any questions, I think there's a, a, a chat where you can do that, there where I can read them, so I can answer them either on the fly or at the end of the, um, of the session. So please make sure you use that. Now I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Okay, um, I hope you can all see this presentation now. This is the Open Source Summit and um, that's the reason why I want to talk about open source platforms, um, cloud platforms to be precise. Um, we're going to have a look into what Kubernetes, Cloud Foundry, and Knative can do for you, what else is out there, what you can use. Um, I probably have the most detailed view on those three because I have most, exp most experience with them. Um, <clears throat> there are definitely more, uh, but I'm not going to have a lot more time to cover all that because it's there's only 40 to 45 minutes. Now, um, before I dive into that, I will probably say a few words on who I am and what I do, how I basically came to give this talk. Um, also then switching more onto the focus of this topic, where did all this come from? A um, little bit at the, at the history, how things evolved, what basically influenced other things. And then also dive into to, to look what basically is a platform. What would I think of um, when I say the term, the term platform? What are the things people could expect to get as benefits out of it and in turn have to invest basically to, to deal with it? Um, and then on the technology side, as I said, Kubernetes, being the um, most popular and prominent version of cloud platforms nowadays. Uh, we'll also relate that to Cloud Foundry and Knative. If the time allows, to go a little bit into a demo and then try to wrap things up. Now, as I said, a few words about myself. This was a bit of an older version when my hair was a little bit young, <laughs> a little shorter, not younger. And um, so, in, in my basically uh, daily job, I advise and help clients on their way towards the cloud. I will say a few things more about that soon. On the open source side of things, I am uh, an organizer um, of a user group or a meetup, so to say, in, in the area of Stuttgart. Now, of course, Stuttgart is quite a few kilometers away from Japan, but um, as in those times, most things are being done remotely anyway, uh, you're of course also very much invited to, to join. Um, if the time zone doesn't really match, um, we still have those, um, those sessions recorded and you can find them on YouTube. If you have any questions about that or about myself or about anything that comes to your mind uh, and you don't want to write it into the chat right now, you can always reach out to me on Twitter. There's my handle below. So feel free also to use this possibility. Okay, so reason uh, why I came to this talk is basically a result of my day job where I help, or at least I try to help um, people from their move to from the old world to the new world, so to say. I mean, the, uh, I also help people starting with cloud if they don't have an old world, but a lot of people do. And um, so deciding on which environment to run your workloads is probably one of the most important decisions in there. Also, what kind of skill will the people need to work on that? So it's a choice of technologies, providers, um, education, and of course, making all those things secure. So um, this is where I'm in, in, in various forms. This could be like on a strat strategic high level away um, or educating people with classes. 
um, or really hands-on uh, implementation and or migration of, of applications towards cloud. Now, looking at that, um, this is a bit of a, a timeline um, in, in history from things relating to what we today call cloud platforms. Now, an interesting fact is it already started very early. So in 1979 is the first thing on that scale. Um, now, with Chainroot alone, I wouldn't probably argue a cloud platform was possible, but as a fundamental concept follows cloud platforms, I would probably argue that the container technology is probably the most important thing to, um, to run the cloud native workloads. And um, Docker is the most prominent or popular technology in that space. And I think most people have heard of that by now. Um, interesting is Docker only came to exist existence in 2013, whereas the technologies to build such a container were already finished in 2007. So um, it really took quite a while until the technology got adopted. And even more interesting, there were already technologies before Docker that did pretty much a similar thing. Like for example, Linux container came out in 2008. And normally if I do that talk live and I ask people if they know Docker or if they know Linux containers, the, the answer is pretty clear. I mean, there are a few people that have heard of Linux containers, um, but um, I don't know a lot of people that really use them or, st or still use them in, in, in production. Um, so, but still, um, maybe it wasn't the right time for the technology back then. Then um, in 2011, two technologies came out with Cloud Foundry and um, OpenShift uh, to, with the aspect, with the, the focus of like something like a platform as a service to run, to orchestrate, to scale, to fail over your cloud native applications. And, um, this is pretty interesting because they, they did a lot of things that Kubernetes does today um, without using Kubernetes and without using Docker. So <clears throat> that has changed over the time because um, the adoption of Kubernetes is, is just so, uh, so big. And this is also something we're gonna look at, like how did this technology start? And now how have they transformed under, under the influence of, of Kubernetes? We'll have a look at Istio, Knative, and then the latest Cloud Foundry developments. I'm not going to talk on all of them, but it's basically the Cloud Foundry for Kubernetes part, which we're going to have a look into in the live demo if, if, um, if this works out. Now, there you can see um, there was quite a bit of history, and that also leaves um, the people today in the, in the decision. So well, what could be the right one for me, and um, how can I approach that? Now, if you, this is, I could also do that live, but it's, I mean, the screen will just work as well. Um, if you put the three technologies into a Google Trends search, um, the, the result is very clear. I mean, um, Kubernetes dominates this space by far. I mean, this, I don't think this is only to the space where people Google for that search term. It's, it also reflects fairly, pretty much the adoption. So um, Kubernetes came to the game fairly later, but um, it really took the world by, by storm. And um, even if you take Kubernetes out, uh, you can see that Knative, well, Knative came even later and was built on Kubernetes in 2018. Cloud Foundry is doing kind of a steady line there. Um, the question was for me, why, why do people, um, why is that, right? Um, why is the one so popular, the others are not? Um, what can it do better or worse? And these are the things I would like to reflect here a little bit. Now, <clears throat> I personally started with this journey um, in the days of Cloud Foundry before Kubernetes. And um, looking at things, as I said, from a past perspective, like platform as a service, you don't really worry too much about those containers. Um, the, the focus, you're more on an, on an application level. So you push the applications, you bind them to services, you use routes for the connection to the end user. So all those, these concepts are fairly 
easy to grasp and understand. They don't really have all that much configuration possibilities and scope, um, but they're very, very much tailored and, and, and focused for a, certain, for a certain use case. Now, if you start, when I started with Kubernetes, there were a lot of more things, uh, as you can see here. And, and to be fair, this is not like a one-to-one -one comparison. What, so you, I, I don't want to say you need all the things here um, that you need um, to do the same thing with like with the two artifacts before in Cloud Foundry. But uh, what I would say is you should understand most of them in order to, to figure out what is the right way for me to do it. Because Kubernetes has way more options and configuration scope, which can be very powerful, but which makes it also sometimes difficult to learn and understand. Even though, especially if you look at all the things here, um, you wouldn't even find a, a part which is called application. And um, the reason is that Kubernetes doesn't really operate on that way, uh, on that level. Kubernetes operates on the level of containers. And you see a container here, this is also a Docker image here. These are the, this is like the abstraction level that the platform speaks. So this is also already one of the fundamental differences there. Nevertheless, this is how the, the way, how things look. Uh, in, in this context, I found a really funny tweet from Aaron Gupta, who is like, I think a, a Docker captain and a Java champion and very active in the Kubernetes space as well. Um, so he, I think he understands really well what he's talking about and uh, saying everybody doing Kubernetes seems to be not happy with it. And everybody who's not doing Kubernetes seems to be craving for it. So there's, and I mean, it's probably not that way that people are not happy with Kubernetes. I don't agree with that um, because I, um, I think this can make you very happy, but there's a certain truth in that, um, that there is, there's a big uh, attraction or hype towards the technology and as soon as people get to start working with it, the, um, a lot of people realize it, it's, it's not as easy as they have thought in the first place. And um, so that also brings in a, a high level, a high degree of, of complaints. And um, starting from here, we will, we will see where we're going to go. Now, um, coming to the term platform. Um, so what does that mean? I would try to to illustrate that on, on a bit of a diagram, starting from a perspective of a developer and also figure out what are the additional roles that a platform describes. So if the developer has the intention to build and write, write and build code and run it so some, some users can, can benefit or exploit it, the first step would probably be to put it into like a source code repo, um, to do a build step and get a runnable artifact out of that. And those things are more normally done with CI and CD pipelines um, with a high degree of automation if, if people do that right. And um, on the other side, a lot of code will probably not work as the, with the code alone. They will depend on legacy systems like databases, messaging, or any other third-party tier applications. So there's the second role coming in, the people to administer those, those pieces. Now, to, for the application to talk to the database, it most likely needs some configuration or credentials to actually get there. In the end, those things will kind of be baked into a container or at least be provided to a container to consume that. And um, then it needs to run somewhere. Now, all of that, is probably what I would say see as a, as a platform. And there are, there's the third role, which is called the so-called the administrator um, to run um, these things in an, in an automated fashion. And we can see a lot of technologies down there that, that provide things like that. And I also would like to mention that there's a bit of a fourth role because depending on what level you end, what abstraction level you enter that platform, um, it's not always clear um, who owns which responsibilities. So who owns, and I, I think it's pretty obvious that the developer owns the coding part, but who owns the build part? Who is basically building the framework to build the container, uh, the, to build the application right? And then next step would also be who owns the, um, the part of building the container? 
And that includes like who is providing the base image for that container and who is about to patch that image if things go wrong. So this role doesn't always come to existence um, or like to visibility very quickly, but um, if something goes wrong, it's suddenly there. And um, it also needs some kind of a lot of clarification. Um, yeah, who is now in the position to patch such a corrupt base image in case if I have, for example, a heart bleed uh, or any similar uh, vulnerability that only appeared at a certain point in time when the code was already running in production. And so a platform to, to wrap things up is basically, I'm missing a slide here, um, is something that will help all those included roles. And most likely you will have all that four roles, even if it's in like in one or two persons, but you have all that roles. A platform's responsibility is to make those things easy to people that consume it. So the, the less people have to do with recurring tasks, the, the more able uh, they are to focus on things that are really important and, and make a difference for the consumers. Now, a couple of ways to look at that. Um, I'm just gonna move my image here around a little. Um, so most of you will be familiar with like the day zero to day three um, operations. And um, where the day one and day two are in, in the context we talk about the, the important ones to looking at what's the platform. This is basically where the code is built, where the, con the code is packaged, where it's con containerized and deployed to the application and then uh, to the platform. And then on day two, the platform taking over with all um, the, the power that it has to like scale, recover from failure, update and patch dynamically, providing observation possibilities and so on. So the differentiation is, is really being, being made here um, to say these are the capabilities that I need, so this is the right platform for me. Um, another one to look at is um, which is the abstraction layer that my platform would work with? Um, is it going to need only containers? Does it accept also looking at source code in forms of either applications or even go further and go enter the world of uh, what is called serverless or function as a service, um, where event-driven architectures work and you have only very short-living um, application snippets that are being executed very often. So there's a lot of distinction to be made. And just to take this away up front there, there is no best platform to solve all the problems. I mean, that it's, um, um, it is always, I told you I'm a consultant, so the answer will always be, it depends. Um, and you can see a, quite a few factors here, what it really depends on. Now, as I said before, that platform will help to make it easy for the roles involved to do the right thing. And starting from here, we're going, gonna look at the various platform technologies. So um, Kubernetes, that the one that everybody seems to wanna have, or seem, at least seems to Google about, um, is actually coming from the company Google. Um, Google has an internal container platform um, that it uses for the majority of their, of their workloads, which uses the, a very similar uh, container and orchestration concept. Um, this was never um, open sourced in, the, in that way, um, but from a technology perspective, it, it goes into the same, uh, very much in the same direction. And uh, Google decided to basically um, put that into a open source format and give it out to the world. And um, to basically come up with something which is not opinionated, very open and extensible. Um, so uh, a very virtual ground for a lot of uh, new open source um, projects and possibilities. It's the major project of the CNCF, um, but as I said before, it has given um, ground to, to many, many new developments, uh, which influence the way we run our workloads today. So <clears throat> if we're gonna do the same thing as before and say, let's start from a development perspective and say, I have an app and I want consumers to get to this app uh, on a runtime. Then the first thing 
that needs to be done is actually doesn't really touch Kubernetes um, because you have to build, as I said, this container. Um, the Docker file is probably the most prominent way to do that. However, there are alternatives. There is, for example, a component called Chip from Google if you have a Java application. There is also the build packs technology that I come to speak of later. But let's just assume you need some mechanism to get your base container image, a runtime for whatever your application is about, and then builds your image. Put the application on top, and you have a ready container image with your application. You need to push this to a container repo or container registry. And um, that's the way the, all the initial and required steps you need to do before you can act actually do um, Kubernetes. Now, in Kubernetes, um, this is always a bit difficult to visualize. Um, I decided to use the, the term kubectl create to create a so-called deployment. What that means, it will first of all reference um, the image from the registry that you have pushed before. This is, um, without that, it can't do anything. It will not be able to see an app or something like that. And it creates a construct which is called a pod. And the pod is, um, means one too many containers in technical terms. In biological terms, it is a group of whales. And you probably have seen that Docker whale icon before. So it already implies from that point, multiple containers can run in such a pod. Um, I symbolize this with a second container in here. Over that, uh, the, the, the umbrella object of that is a so-called replica set. And as the name said, it, this is about the replicas of such a pod. Important to know here is that even though you hand, can have multiple containers within a pod, Kubernetes can only handle pods. So this is the, 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 the smallest unit of deployment that Kubernetes can, can, can address. So it wouldn't be able to say, I want this container to be running with three instances inside of the pod and this only with one. So they either start and stop together um, <clears throat> and that's it. Um, on top of this replica set, there is a so-called deployment object, um, which kind of maintains the versions um, of, um, of those replica sets. So whenever you have like a new container and you have patched your image, um, then you can do that and you will be able to expose your endpoint to, um, to an end user. Now, um, looking at that, that already contains like, a lot of things that you can do. So you, you can scale um, on basis of your applications in the, in the containers. Um, you can dynamically switch over from one version to the other you have possibilities to expose that workload to the end user. Um, and what you can't see here yet is basically you are able to um, recover if something fails. So um, yeah, the value you can here see is it's a runtime for container workloads. If things crash, they will bring it back. Um, it can manually and automatically scale the pods. It can ro do rolling updates for a new version and you can easily extend it um, and uh, put it up uh, where where um, wherever you want. Like as it is coming from a from a bulletproof um, implementation of internal Google workloads, so is is it has a high degree of robustness and and um, and stability. And you can get pretty much you can get it pretty much everywhere. So either on your local machines or you can get to the, to the major cloud providers. Most of them will have a Kubernetes service. So it's a really easy way to, to get started there. Um, looking at the, the, the problems, so to say, I mean, um, Kubernetes in itself is, is agnostic per default what is in the container. You can configure it to, to like monitor and observe that. But in the default state, um, Kubernetes will just treat each container in the same way. Um, another problem that I see very often is getting to understand and apply all that correctly it takes a, a steep learning curve. Um, the extensibility and configurability 
is of course an advantage, but it can also be a, a disadvantage in case um, um, you're just getting losing things out of sight um, because you, um, it, it can get somewhat confusing. YAML is always a point about a lot of discussions. So either you like it or you don't, um, you most likely will have to deal with it uh, when working with Kubernetes. And um, to look at which workloads is the right one, then it's definitely gonna be uh, container images because that's what it really deals with. Now, looking at that, um, that means it will divide those responsibility into a couple of segments. And um, only after you registered the image, Kubernetes will be able to take over. So day zero and day one is basically not really a Kubernetes thing. Kubernetes will really unfold its power um, on, the, on the day two side. I mean, you could, of course, argue that deployment is also a step in there. That is, of course, true. Um, but um, it doesn't in interfere with the, the, the building of the container process. Now, um, look at Cloud Foundry. And as I said before, Cloud Foundry was already around in, um, in the time in 2008 with a strong focus to be very simple for development. And there is, if I only could explain Cloud Foundry in one sentence, it would probably be the, the, um, the haiku below where it says, here's my source code, run it on the cloud for me, I don't care how, which already goes a long way and shows the perspective. Um, this, it's really, I don't want to worry about everything what is below my source code. Um, and I want developers to, to be able to, to quickly build, test and deploy and scale their applications. So, um, the biggest contrast is different flying height, basically towards looking at Kubernetes and also very opinionated. So it's by far not as configurable and extensible and so on. It was really designed as a way, take it, this, this works that way and it should be fine for you. Now. Looking at the same thing in, in Cloud Foundry terms is you would, uh, you would access an application code directly. So you would say CF push to an application um, and then this application would go into, uh, into the platform. So basically there's an invisible line here. I hope you can see my mouse um, that where the user interacts with and doesn't interact with. So the user in this case would only submit the code. Um, everything that comes into the hand of containers will be, will be handled within the platform. So Cloud Foundry will detect what would be the right base image, what would be the right runtime, which is called build pack here um, to run that application, create an image for you, put it to a registry and run it. So um, it will eliminate those steps um, and also take it out of the configurational scope. Now, the other important thing our command is to do the such a bind service call, which will basically get the configuration of backend services and inject them into this application container. Also, to make things uh, simpler in terms of handling the backend services from a, from a developer perspective. Of course, there needs an operator that provides that uh, services, um, but there is also an API to, to, to work with this. Um, important to say here is um, this distinction between applications and services. This basically ties back to um, the 12 factor app um, manifest, which kind of declares or recommends, I don't know how to say, uh, a separation of stateless applications and stateful services. This is trying to be enforced here also with the names of the services, all the, the stateful components, like database messaging, everything state affected, and the applications should be stateless um, code. Otherwise, the automation within the platform um, will we would not know it and would treat the code in the wrong way. I mean, this is, of course applies in the same way for Kubernetes. If you have in-memory state and you scale your application, you might have very unwanted effects. Now, um, in the end, it will bring back a route 
to the end user. So um, similar to a service and or an ingress in, in Kubernetes, this is also being done manually here, uh, automatically here. All right, so the biggest difference you can see here is um, the day, um, the, the, the responsibility of the platform goes further to the left um, because this one is really involved in build, packaging, and containerizing of the application. Um, whereas the, the part on the left will, will can have a bit, bit better focus on providing the source code um, of the application. Now, um, so having a do a value statement in here under the from a from a workload handling perspective, it does a very similar thing as Kubernetes does. Basically, with a new version, it does exactly what Kubernetes does because it's running on a Kubernetes infrastructure now. The focus really is simplicity and the application awareness. So um, you work on a different level and can can things from from that do that from that perspective. Now on the, on the problem side, I would say, um, yeah, it's, um, I don't think people know about that so much. Um, same will be a, a thing with Knative later on. Um, and it also has this limitation of, of the build packs coverage. So in Kubernetes, you can run pretty much everything that you can run in a container. In Cloud Foundry, you can only build those things uh, where an application build pack is there. I mean, this is definitely the case for most um, common programming languages. Uh, but if you outsource this, um, this runs a bit responsibility to the platform, this is of course something you expect to work. And um, this of course could be a thing um, where, where you might have limitations. Now in there, you can say you can run apps and, and containers. Um, so <clears throat> the focus, however, is definitely doing things on an application level. So I will, if, you, if you use Cloud Foundry and only push container images, and you're basically missing out the, the core part of the value. All right, um, finally, there is uh, Knative, which is an, um, as the name says, native to Kubernetes. So this was built um, when Kubernetes already existed and had significant influence from previous platform as a service concepts like out of OpenShift or Cloud Foundry. It also tried to um, put in the uh, functionality of running functions or, or, or being a platform for running function workloads that start very quickly and also terminate very quickly. So to get a better utilization um, out of your environment without having idling components. Um, it, this one needs Kubernetes and Istio Istio being a, a service mesh um, so that it actually can have insights of the, of the traffic within the cluster. Uh, in order to react on that traffic, it also needs to know about that traffic and say, if there's a lot of workloads coming in, they need to scale up. If there's no workloads coming in at all, I need to scale down, even scale down to zero, so there are no instances left. Um, and yeah, sum it up to focus on, on simplifying the Kubernetes experience on one side and also provide serverless capabilities. Um, now to be fair, um, Knative provides more than what I'm showing here today. So the, there's a serving component, um, which can be seen as an equivalent, so to say, in functionality to what we have seen on, on Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes side. But there's also an additional eventing component, as the name says, that um, takes care of event-driven uh, application architectures and integrates with serving here um, very well to, uh, for, for audit eventing mechanisms. There's also Tekton as a um, build and deploy component, however, this was initially a part of Knative, but now got outsourced as a separate project. So of course it still works with it, um, but it's not a really an official Knative mandatory component anymore. Now to get to your, um, to get to your um, Knative running application, 
Um, you basically, sorry for that. You basically need to repeat all the same steps um, that you have done in, in Kubernetes. Um, even though Knative has the ability to deal with functions and deal with the functions properly, still those functions need to be provided in the form of a container. And so Knative will not do the packaging of functions into container images. Um, but it can deal with images containing functions in, in, in a very good way. So again, um, the responsibility of building that image and that part of the action is there. However, this, this is something that, that can, for example, be addressed with the Tecton component. Now, once it is running, um, <clears throat> it, is, it has a, a very um, simple to use API. It says there's a the, the top level object is so-called KN service. Now this makes things a little um, complicated as because we have services in Kubernetes and we have services in Cloud Foundry and all of them mean a little different thing. So here in, in KF, the service is actually the, the, the top level component of, of running such a workload item. Um, in this case, yeah, you provide an image, um, then the service object will be instantiated. This will in turn create a configuration and a route object. And the configuration object will have potentially multiple revisions. So as I said before in Kubernetes, you can have deploy multiple replica sets and one will um, basically replace the other one with a, with a graceful um, uh, a failover, so to say, or like, um, rolling out the new one without uh, giving an outage or downtime to the, to the, to the end user and the consumers. Um, KNF takes this a step further and with revisions, it is, you are able to run multiple, multiple of those revisions, basically multiple different versions of your application and the route will decide how much percentage you would get on either side or configuration, how the traffic is being routed to those revisions. There is the concept of like canary deployments where you would like to say, um, maybe I want to roll out that new version only for a group of tests or a, a certain region or a, a certain percentage of, of, of users, then you could do exactly that. And see if, if you realize it's not working the way it should, then you could simply roll it back or change the percentage back to the one um, which is still in there and, and is working well. Now, to put this into a perspective, there are also as route, image, revision, and service, a fairly minimal concept of things that you need to deal with in order to use a K-native. So I'd also say from a, uh, from a learning curve or from a uh, developer simplicity kind of perspective, um, there, is a, there is an improvement there. Now, looking at this, um, of course, you need to do those steps in advance. But on day two, um, Knative brings significant advantages. So um, yeah, it runs function as a service workloads. It can scale to zero. It, it of course can also auto scale to a much higher amount if the workload suddenly increases. Um, you can auto scale in Kubernetes as well. But out of the box, the metrics to trigger that are only CPU and, and memory. Basically, the mess, the the metrics the container can can um, um, can detect. In here, the metrics that can be detected is also the traffic on the wire. So if there are sort of things coming through, it will scale up. Um, and the weighted routing to say I want to have this and that percentage um, of of the workloads. So. Again, the adoption and popularity is a, is a problem. Um, late integration right here, this must be a copy and paste error. Um, I mean, you could, for example, say it, it, it should have been there earlier, but this wasn't really possible because um, it used it, it, it required Istio. So it, uh, I'm gonna just correct that. This one is wrong. So sorry for this, um, but we can jump back in here. Um, and I took this error out. Important thing is on a workload perspective, you can 
it has containers, applications, and functions. So um, it is able to uh, it provides mechanisms to build that, and um, they should also all come in a container scope. But it has the the ability to look into them uh, quite a bit better. Now, <clears throat> why am I summarizing all this? Um, to say. Kubernetes will probably come along and provide the, the, um, the container platform's technical capabilities. So you can uh, crash your workloads, Kubernetes will bring it back. You can scale them up in case if you need uh, more instances and more, more, more power or load balancing. Um, and so everything you would expect of such a platform is something that Kubernetes provides in a very, very well and robust way. So um, the, the cool things with Cloud Foundry and Kdata really is, um, it's, they're not replacing it. So it's not like an either or and say, well, if I wanna do Cloud Foundry or if I do Kdata, I cannot do Kubernetes because they're all running on the same platform. Um, so they can just be added and installed on, on top of a running Kubernetes environment. This will give you the possibility to say, um, well, I can try, I, I can now push code and I can push containers. Um, and if I, and, and in the end, they are gonna be running in pods on, on the same platform. Um, if, um, and so Cloud Foundry can be seen as just a layer on top that provides some easier abstraction um, for developers. So a better developer experience and the, to me, the most important factor. So it's, uh, it's totally free of containers. Now, Knative um, adds on a different way. So it, it brings, it extends the possibilities to scale zero, to do those revisions, to scale high automatically and, and do percentage routing. Um, so um, now, with that, I will probably stop this one right here because I'm seeing I'm running out of time. Um, what I would probably would like to, to jump in here um, is I would encourage, I would like to encourage people to, to try all that because as I said before, Kubernetes has many, many different offerings. Um, there's a mini cube, there is a kind, there is a Docker desktop, all on a local environment. So you can run them on your machine and just like start using them. There are a lot of options um, for public services, um, Azure, Amazon, Google, IBM, and many, many more. Um, and most of them have like a free tier or so where you can start um, using them and, and just play around with it. Now, for the technologies I've shown, um, uh, Knative um, and uh, the various Cloud Foundry options, there are a lot of tutorials out there which makes it really easy just to start with it and try it out. And, and then, um, it, it doesn't come with a very high cost or with a very high effort. Uh, so if you decide and go try to do Kubernetes anyway, uh, why not put the other, one of the other two on top and see if, the, if this doesn't bring any, bring any benefit for you. Now, unfortunately I'm realizing it is already um, 45 minutes and probably over time here. So I, I actually, I did prepare a demo um, and I'm, it's kind of unfortunate that I couldn't go in there, but I thought the other, other pieces were definitely Im, important as well. Um, if you are interested in that, I have given the talk before in a longer version also with demos, you will be able to find it here on, the, on this playlist um, or reach out to me um, and I can definitely link that. Once this video gets published on YouTube, uh, I can also link the others, um, but, but for today, it probably wouldn't make sense if I step into a demo for one or two minutes. So um, apologies for that. Um, I hope you still enjoyed the talk.
And as I said before, um, if, if you have more interested in those, uh, in those topics, feel free to, to reach out to me. And with that, I would like to say thank you and open this up for questions.